Oh, mood lighting. Great. Uh, welcome. Good evening. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Mira Levinson. Um, I am the Juliana W. and William Foss uh, Thompson Professor of Education and Society here at the Harvard Graduate School of Education. Um, and it is a true honor and pleasure to be with you here today in this room and also um, uh, virtually via live stream. Um, it's really my pleasure to welcome you here um, uh, to this Ask With Forum, uh, which is um, HGSE's, the Harvard Graduate School of Education, signature in-person public lecture series. It's, uh, it's, it's designed to foster great conversation, which I am confident you will hear today, uh, and the respectful exchange of views, um, and to reflect a rich diversity of ideas and perspectives in the field. Uh, we're really uh, delighted and honored that you've joined us on this rainy day, and for those of you who are students, I'm aware that this is finals period. Um, uh, for what um, I, for what I think is going to be incredibly stimulating and insightful conversation about education, truth, and the future of democracy, uh, that is an uh, you know an absurdly ambitious uh, and grandiose title, and I wish uh, that it was actually. Uh, over ambitious and over grandiose and that this was sort of a, a niche topic um, uh, that was not particularly timely, but you know, that's not to be, right? I think that um, uh, this is actually all too voluminous of an issue and relevant to uh, one here today in the United States and actually really in many places around the world. Um, before I move into sort of what we're going to focus on today and what our uh, order of operations will be and our speakers, I will note that this is um, both uh, an Ask With Forum as part of HGSE series and also the uh, kickoff forum in a, a two, two and a half day conference uh, uh, designed to launch the field of educational ethics. Um, and so uh, partly in celebration of that, I will mention we have a reception with great thanks to the Dean's office um, immediately after this forum across the way in Gutman Conference uh, Center where you'll be able to talk to the speakers and to others who are here for the conference. And I invite you to join us also both uh, tomorrow and Saturday for a whole series of panel discussions and long breaks in between them so you can actually have conversation and process what you're hearing and meet people uh, to think about educational ethics more broadly. Uh, so with that, let me turn now to, again, this um, uh, ridiculously grandiose topic on education, truth, and the future of democracy. And um, I guess I think about this in some ways as a triangle where each of these, you know, any two, right, education, truth, and democracy, each is in relationship to the others. Um, uh, and in this uh, bi-directional way, right? So education is in part uh, about the process of imparting truth and helping learners uh, discover truth and learn how to discern truth. Education is also, of course, um, subject to other people's opinions about truth and contestation over what truth is. And it is the truth that we believe about the world that imparts shape what kind of education we think is appropriate to impart and how it is we think that it is important to teach learners how to discern truth. You can think of similar relationships between uh, truth, and truth and democracy, right? We know ways in which democracy may help to promote the discovery of truth and that truth may promote democracy. And we also see ways in which contestation over truth and, where, and mistruths uh, can pervert democracy and ways in which the failures of democracy, as democracy weakens, can also end up having uh, a weakening effect on our capacity to discern truth, to understand others' truths, and to talk about the nature of truth itself, right? And then as we think about the relationship between um, education and democracy, uh, my colleague Jacob Fay and I have written about uh, this sort of uh, bilateral relationship uh, thinking about educating in a democracy and educating for democracy, and that those two are actually different enterprises. And that in some ways, as we think about what it means to educate for democracy and to help learners be good citizens in democracies, oftentimes that uh, 
involves taking stands on things that may themselves be democratically contested, right? And we see, in fact, right now, um, it said to the panel, I wasn't going to do this, but on my mind is the fact that the Florida State Legislature has just today passed uh, State Bill 266 that is one example of many coming out of Florida these days of um, democratic um, de deliberation and decision making, at least by the le state legislature, about wh um, what kinds of education are to be allowed and disallowed and what is allowed to happen on college campuses and who should control that. And uh, for some of us, it is actually the fragility of democracy that is leading to such um, uses of democracy to control speech on college campuses. For others, it's a perspective of being a sort of efflorescence of democratic engagement in thinking about education when that had not been going on for a while. And so I'm sure that we'll be thinking about such issues today. Um, so the last thing I'll say before I introduce our speakers and give us the run of events is that sort of is this sort of triangle and these relationships that we're involved in thinking about today. What roles can schools and universities play in helping to shore up fragile democracies like the US uh, and other countries around the world, um, including through the production of true knowledge and democratic citizens? And what challenges do schools and universities face in achieving these aims, including challenges partly of schools and universities' own making, as it's incumbent upon us to acknowledge that schools and universities have our own failures to promote truth and democracy in the past and also continuing now in the present. So this is an important way to think about schools and democracies, uh, sorry, schools and universities' potential roles, including some things that they do, but also to think about the ways in which those roles themselves have um, sometimes uh, perverted, undermined um, all three elements of this tri triangle, truth, democracy, and even education itself. So with that, let me share with you who we'll be hearing from today, um, which I'm very, very, very excited about. Uh, we're going to be starting with uh, Nima Avashia, uh, who is in her 20th year as an educator uh, in the Boston Public Schools and an activist um, also in the Boston Public Schools. Uh, she taught um, civics and history uh, for 19 of those years, uh, actually. Uh, most of those years, or maybe all of those years, yeah, all of those years at um, our, our shared middle school, uh, the McCormick Middle School, when I actually left uh, teaching in the Boston Public Schools to start here um, as a professor, Nima moved into my eighth grade uh, classroom and has, I think, occupied it ever since until this year. Um, uh, uh, she's an amazing educator. She was City of Boston Educator of the Year in 2013. She is now uh, in a new role as an ethnic studies coach um, for the Boston Public Schools. She published a beautiful memoir last year with West Univer Virginia University Press, Another Appalachia, Coming Up Queer and in Indian in a Mountain Place. It's received really great reviews in a whole range of publications, including being named Best LGBTQ Memoir of 2022 by Book Riot. It's one of the New York uh, Public Library's best books of 2022 and is a Lambda Literary Award finalist. And she's working on a second book, an essay collection about unlearning the rules that we were raised with. Next, we'll hear from Seagal Ben Parath, a professor of education um, and also philosophy and political science at the University of Pennsylvania. Um, of, she's played a whole bunch of roles there, which I'm not going to rehearse to you, uh, of particular relevance to our discussion today. Uh, she chaired the Committee on Open Expression at Penn, which is uh, the committee through which all complaints come through about speakers, you know, professor speech, student speech, et cetera, uh, from 2015 to 2019. So, a, you know, an active time for concerns about speech uh, in American democracy and college campuses. And she served as executive committee member of the Andrea Mitchell School for the Stu Center for the Study of Democracy. She's the author of six books, including most recently um, 
the book Cancel Wars, which is a really wonderful work of political philosophy, philosophy of education, policy thinking, uh, really clear-minded guidance um, for uh, educators um, and um, school and campus leaders and so forth about how to think about these hard issues. And she also uh, wrote in 2017 a book called Free Speech on Campus. Uh, then we'll hear from John Sylvanus Wilson, Jr. Uh, he's currently executive director of the Millennium Leadership Initiative at the American Association of State Colleges and Universities, following some time here at Harvard, both as president in residence here at HGSC and as the um, special advisor to Harvard's president. Uh, before that, he was in Washington as the executive director of the White House Initiative on Historically Black Colleges and Universities under President Obama, for which he was well prepared because he was also, before that, the 11th president um, of Morehouse College. Um, he has a long career in uh, university teaching and administration, which I'm not going to go through. Um, uh, his first book uh, has just come out from Harvard Education Press and is very relevant to today's conversation, Hope and Healing, Black Colleges and the Future of Democracy. And I think with that title, it'll be clear why uh, I'm really, really excited to hear what he has to say. And I'm not offering an evaluation of it only because it is literally coming out in, I don't know, a week or something. Is that right? Yes. So I haven't read it yet, but I am looking forward to it. Uh, we are going to proceed by hearing from each of our um, panelists in the order that I introduced them. Um, I'll then moderate a conversation with them for a while, um, probably surprising them with questions that we have not planned. And then um, we'll have some time for you to have uh, Q&A, and at that point, I'll invite you up to the microphones. Uh, okay, great. So with that, let me hand it over to Nima. Hi, everybody. Thanks so much for having me here today with you. Thanks to Mira for inviting me. Um, thanks to Liz and Jody for coordinating all of the things that have to be coordinated around an experience like this. That's a mountain of work in and of itself. Um, I'm really grateful to be here with you. Um, as Mary said, I was a teacher for 19 years, about 11 of which were in the classroom that she previously occupied before me. Um, but I'm not a teacher anymore. Um, and I'm not a teacher anymore because I got to a place where I couldn't reconcile the gap between what young people were saying they needed and what we were offering them in schools. And as much as I tried as an individual educator in my classroom to respond and respond and respond, what I felt like was happening was I was moving further and further away from what was expected of me as a teacher, from the culture of my school, um, from the expectations of the district that I worked in. And I got to a place where I felt like I, could not, I couldn't figure out how to be the educator students needed to be, me to be, and also fulfill the responsibilities that were being articulated for me by my superiors. That's a really hard place to be um, because I believe deeply in the concept of public education. I think in an era where we are in a moment of entrenched racial and socioeconomic segregation, where privatization is eroding our public goods in ways that like, we can't even get our heads around fast enough as they're being taken away, like, public school is one of the last bastions of the common good. But we are failing to make good on the potential that they possess. We're failing to prepare the young people in our classrooms to preserve and protect a threatened democracy, a threatened planet, a threatened existence. You all have seen the reports. The last few years, we've seen an unprecedented increase in mental health struggles among young people. Even in Boston, with all of its resources, we have kids sitting on beds in the hallway of Children's Hospital, boarding there, waiting for inpatient placement. And lots of folks will have you believe that that is entirely because of the isolation that they experienced during COVID. As a teacher of those young people, I can tell you that's definitely part of it, but it's not the whole story. Another part, I think, is because our young people are experiencing a kind of collective gaslighting at the hands of adults in our country. We are failing to meet this moment, to hear and respond to what they're telling us they need, to acknowledge the realities that they face. Educational leaders at the state and federal levels in particular push these normalcy narratives in a moment when what is actually required is complete transformation. And instead, transformation plans in many public school systems, including the one where I work, are just arguing for more of the same. More standardized testing, more standardized curriculum, Click on this boring, irrelevant reading, answer this nonsense open response question. 
Meanwhile, the world is burning outside of our classrooms. Every time they look up, our young people look at rising sea levels, at assaults on democracy, at rampant gun violence, at impunity for perpetrators of racial injustice, at full throttle legislative assaults on queer and trans folks' existence, at a huge student debt crisis, and yet in their classrooms, they're being told, you need to do this work to pass that test to go to that college so you can come out saddled with debt and maybe get a job if AI hasn't rendered that work irrelevant. And then we wonder why young people are in this moment of crisis, why they're disengaged, why they feel disconnected, why they don't see purpose and meaning in their lives, why they don't see a relationship between the education that they get in schools and the state of our democracy, between education and their existence. It's because we aren't making that relationship the center of what we do in schools right now. The thing is, we actually know a lot of the moves that would make school work for our young people. My new job coaching ethnic studies teachers shows me every day that when young people's identities become text, when their community stories are the stories they're learning in school, when stories of transformative resistance against oppressive systems are at the core of learning, young people thrive. Professor Jill Mehta, who works here, has shown us that deeper learning, space that allows students to really engage in intense study of real world challenges and then work towards solutions, is another context where young people thrive. Across the state of Massachusetts, the MCIEA, the Massachusetts Consortium for Innovative Education Assessment, which is a partnership of eight public school districts and their unions, has worked to build an expansive rather than reductive accountability model, one that allows students and schools to demonstrate the multitude of strengths they possess and the many ways in which they thrive. And fundamentally, we also know that when young people are in strong, positive relationships with one another and with adults with a common sense of purpose, they thrive. These models exist, and yet too often they exist at the margins of public education rather than being the center. It's work that educators do in large part without institutional support. And even its existence on the margins is often threatened, certainly by right-wing attacks on public education, which take the form of book bans, curricular censorship, and laws barring educators from acknowledging the fullness of young people's humanity or of their own humanity, but also by existing accountability structures and by leaders obsessed with old notions of normal, both of which make it impossible to build school environments where human-centered education is the work we do together. Just this morning, members of the Boston Teachers Union Ethnic Studies Now Committee released a petition asking city and district leaders to come out strongly in support of teaching truth in schools. They're asking because no such message has been articulated. They're asking because by and large, the work of protecting democracy, of protecting the right to read and speak and express, is being left to educators and young people who are met with silence from their leaders. You might have seen yesterday a huge panic on social media about failing NAEP scores in history and civics. I think that if you're a history or civics teacher, you weren't surprised by that data because you have watched over the last two decades as No Child Left Behind's impacts have gutted history education in our country. I didn't have any colleagues left by the time I left the classroom. There weren't history classes. Everything was humanities, just like smush it all together and you know maybe people will learn something, right? I think it's important to talk about that, but I also wish that I was seeing more coverage of the diminished expectation that we as educators and educational leaders need to actually be protectors of democracy. That our advocacy, our voices, our work with young people is central to upholding democratic ideals. That value isn't articulated or supported in far too many spaces. In its place, we see silence, or worse, the upholding of values that undermine democracy. Sorry. Uh, I really believe, as much as I have left, I still really believe that young people and educators in our schools right now have the will, the creativity, and the passion required to tackle the incredibly difficult questions we face, both as a nation and globally. But they need us to be loud about the kind of work that should be happening in school, and about the discrepancy between that kind of work and what's presently being mandated. They need us to let go of normal and make space for learning environments where the preservation of democracy and of humanity are at the center of the work. If we want our fragile democracy to survive this moment when it is in dire threat, we have to change the way we do school. We have to put young people's voices, needs, and reality at the center and build learning environments that are responsive to them. Thank you.
much. <laughs> yeah, don't get caught. Yeah. Okay, beautiful. I agree with everything. So we're just, <laughs> I'll just say here, here. Um, and definitely these are material things to keep in mind. And I think I'm gonna take another route to uh, get uh, approximately to the same spot that Nima brought us to. Um, one of the things that I worry about um, most hours of day and night is the ways in which we restrict the ideas that are welcome in our classes, in our classrooms, both in K-12 settings and in universities. And I think a lot about the ways in which um, these, the restriction of ideas is reshaping the way that children and young people understand the world and, as Nima just so nicely articulated, are able to um, interact with the world and with the materials that we are expecting them to learn. Um, in schools we are seeing, uh, and that's true both in the K-12 settings and in universities, particularly public universities, we are seeing restrictions on the ideas that are welcome in class that are coming actually from two directions. The one that is the biggest concern to me and that um, Meira and also Nima in a different way mentioned is um, the reactionary legislation that is attempting to um, organize, revise, um, and limit ideas that we are able to interact with. And I think some of the concerns coming from young people have to do with the fact that there are books that they no longer can read and there are topics that can, they can no longer discuss. Uh, and sometimes there are other ones um, that they are required, required to address which are actually not aligned with the kind of things that they are see seeing around them and the kind of people who they are. Uh, and these uh, legislative efforts, some of them uh, have passed in various states, about a dozen states and others uh, that are in the works, um, are surely uh, creating a new environment which is anti-democratic and oftentimes um, in the way that Mayor articulated uh, in her opening remarks, also antithetical to truth, right? Um, in addition to this concern, which is top of my mind, I'm also concerned with ways in which we uh, oftentimes pressure and silence each other. These are not equivalent, right? I'm not trying to show a both sides uh, picture. But I think uh, oftentimes in our classes, uh, particularly in higher education, but increasingly also in K-12, we are seeing a demand that is arising from our polarized state of democracy that people fall in line with ideas that are articulated by one or the other side of the political aisle, right? By one ideology or the other, that people fall in line with these ideas or otherwise be deemed as espousing unacceptable views. Um, and I am concerned about um, some sporadic um, data that we have. It's not, um, uh, it's not as fully articulated or available as we should have it, but we've seen um, efforts at the University of Wisconsin public system and in some other places uh, to survey the perspectives of young people in terms of how free do they feel that they are to express their views uh, among their peers. Um, and increasingly we are seeing that they worry of being labeled um, uh, in a way that is unacceptable to them or a way that they don't see themselves. And so they uh, silence uh, their ideas. And of course, this is a concern uh, relationally and socially and educationally, and it's also a democratic concern, both of these things. Because free inquiry is really at the heart of education and it's at the heart of democracy. And free inquiry is, uh, has to be open, it has to be free willing, but it also has to be organized around norms that we can all accept. And these norms are normally um, anchored in evidentiary practices, right? In uh, the kind of knowledge that we can all agree on and move, stand on and move forward from. 
but these shared epistemic foundations or these shared skills and practices that um, uh, I wouldn't say used to, right, but are, because uh, we've always had fights over uh, the boundaries of truth and the uh, appropriate evidentiary practices to use, and that's a part of science and it's a part of education, but our disagreements over facts, over evidence, and increasingly also over experts that we can turn to in order to resolve disagreements over um, uh, facts and evidence, uh, all of these disagreements are increasingly um, uh, frantic, increasingly um, uh, 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 derailing the conversations that we are able to have. The recommendation or uh, encouragement that we focus on facts, that we create textbooks or materials that would be, uh, like the humanities example you just gave, that would be narrow and focused on what we agree on, this encouragement is empty because facts uh, are in disagreement, as I said, but also because the books that are available to us, which we might, or the textbooks, which we might um, uh, narrow down enough to agree on, are not what we learn, right? This is not how we learn. Even if we manage to create a shared science book or a shared um, history book, which is unlikely at this moment in time, um, uh, that people will, about which people will agree across the polarized uh, political domain, uh, this is not what people, what children, what young people will know. What's in the book is one thing, but put, putting uh, books in front of children, or worse, uh, children in front of Chromebooks, mm -hmm. is not the way in which we learn. For us to be able to expand our knowledge, we have to be able to engage with each other, and we have to be able to engage with each other as full human beings, with our identities, with our differences, with our beliefs and concerns, and we have to be able to do it as epistemic equals. In other words, we have to be able to do it within the context of a classroom in which all of us know that we all see each other as able to learn and contribute knowledge to the shared and the educational endeavors. Our teachers have to believe that about us and we have to believe it about each other. And in order to be able to do that, we have to create appropriate context and boundaries for free inquiry. And uh, we got some examples of what they will look like and I hope we will uh, have the opportunity to discuss some more in our conversation. Thank you. Thank you. I, I think it's uh, going to be clear that we are all aligned up here. Um, and that is in terms of uh, having a sense of, uh, of urgency. Uh, I too have a sense of urgency and that's why I wrote um, the book um, that I wrote. This is my first book. I'm proud to be here with these prolific authors. Um, be out May 16th. Um, that's a plug. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's shameless. Um, but I, um, I wrote this with a sense of um, urgency. And while the title is Hope and Healing, Black Colleges and the Future of American Democracy, the book uh, deals a lot with black colleges, but it's not about black colleges. It's about uh, the national and global consequences in store for us all if American higher education does not do a black college thing. And what I mean by that is in the middle of the last century, um, HBCUs deliberately and aggressively produced the generals and foot soldiers of a movement to transform and elevate democracy. Now, the results of that movement are, are very clear. And if you don't know that, that speaks to the impairment of the education in this country uh, in general. But it is an amazing story. Uh, and in my view, HBCUs are the only subsector of American higher education that has executed on John Dewey's vision. 
And that is, uh, he, he says very clearly, uh, democracy must be born anew every generation and education is its midwife. Um, HBCUs have been a great midwife for American democracy. American higher education in general has not. Full stop. Um, to illustrate this, I want to share with you a quote. Um, this is not a quote from the book. I did not see it until after I published. But I, I want to cite the commencement address. And I see Pat Graham here. I just have to stop and say, she's my dean. <laughs> she's my dean. I'm sorry. I, I, <laughs> dean, <laughs> you're my dean. Uh, loved you then, love you now. All right? Um, the quote is from the 2000 commencement at Harvard University, and it's, um, Bill Gates was the speaker. Here's what he said. He, he confessed uh, one big regret, quote, I left Harvard with no real awareness of the awful inequities in the world and the appalling disparities of health and wealth and opportunity that condemn millions of people to lives of despair. He said that in 1975. Here's the thing. I left Morehouse College acutely aware of every single one of those things, the inequities, the disparities, and not millions, Bill, but billions of people in lives of despair because of what's going on. So that gave me a sense of urgency when I wrote uh, this book. The sense it, it shifted from urgency to emergency. And here I want to cite my, my, my daughter. My daughter was a physics and philosophy major at Stanford University. And she called home while she was taking this course. It's called The Physics of Climate Change, Stephen Schneider. This child was on her way to law school. She had taken practice LSATs had gotten perfect scores. She was probably coming here. But that course changed her life. Because the professor convinced her that there's an emergency in this world, and we better pay attention to it. And so I write about that a little bit. You're right. HBCUs, climate change. It's all, it's all in there. Um, the emergency is this. A broken democracy cannot heal a broken planet. It's impossible, OK? That's why we have an emergency. Now, in this book, I include a prescription. The prescription comes from my biography. I grew up initially in Philadelphia, but we moved to the suburbs, get a little more money. My mom was a teacher. She saw that the books in the Philadelphia schools would set us up to go nowhere in life. That was by design. So she got us out in the suburbs, the lily white suburbs in northern, north of Philadelphia. And boy, that was tough. Not academically, because in my home, you bring home a B, uh, you got a problem, OK? And there was, and that wasn't abuse. We did not experience it that way, but we, we made sure we performed well in school. Um, but it was in a lily white environment, and frankly, I was othered, I was minoritized. If I wasn't invisible, I was hated on. My brother and I, and my two sisters, uh, somehow made my way to Morehouse. Long story, but the pastor of our church was a Morehouse man. He preached about Morehouse more than he preached about Jesus. Um, we thought Jesus was a Morehouse man. So, <laughs> So you got Jesus, you got Martin Luther King, you got the pastor. Where else should I go, right? So I went to Morehouse, and uh, Morehouse was the most psychologically wholesome four-year period of my life. I was not othered. I moved from object to subject. They knew my name. It was a wonderful, wonderful experience. And then I, uh, the problem with it was so many of my classmates, I lost half my class I came in with because they didn't have the money to finish. I come up for graduate school here at Harvard, spent six years here, three degrees, and I have to tell you, I didn't see one student leave here because they ran out of money, not one. I saw it all the time in Morehouse, and I said, 
I looked at this campus, I looked at, Harvard had everything. Anything that could be solved by money was. And I said, Harvard has exactly what Morehouse, Harvard needs exactly what Morehouse has, and Morehouse needs exactly what Harvard has. Harvard had capital preeminence and very little character preeminence. Morehouse had character preeminence and very low capital preeminence. Those two pillars are in my book. They constitute uh, the vision. Capital and character are in the book. I say optimization because preeminence evokes this hierarchy and et cetera, et cetera. Do two more things with my time. Um, I asked the question, how did the gap get so wide? When I attended Morehouse, the endowment was $20 million. $20 million. I suppose I should have been proud because by the time I got back to be pre president of Morehouse, it had grown 6x. When I attended Harvard, the endowment was $1.5 billion. I was calling people, they got over a billion dollars of endowment here. <laughs> Since then, when I come back to be on the Board of Overseers, it has grown 37 times. $53 billion as I was leaving Harvard just a couple of years ago. $53 billion, all right? Let's think about that. My God, my God. I asked in this book, why didn't the Civil Rights Movement, okay, my time's up, let me, let me end with this. <laughs> Why didn't the Civil Rights Movement happen right after Reconstruction? And why wasn't it led by Harvard students and alumni as guided by Harvard presidents and taught by Harvard faculty? Why didn't it, why didn't it wait until the 1960s? You ever think about that? My God, what is this tradition? I'm at time, okay. So, um, that's how I lay the groundwork. I end in the final chapter of three kinds of people we need to educate now. Destination people, second day people, and I end uh, the name of the last chapter, String Shooters. And you got to read the book to understand what that is. Thank you. <laughs> All right, you guys have teed up a lot. Um, I want to push you, actually. Uh, I don't think this is just you know, a philosopher making philosophical distinctions or trying to find differences where there are none. I'm actually curious. So Nima, you talk about the gaslighting uh, of insisting on normalcy when we need transformation. And John, you talked about uh, actually shifting from urgency to emergency. Hmm. And Seagal, by contrast, you actually articulated what sounded to me like a much more small c conservative call hmm. for a return to a certain vision of epistemic equality in the classroom that we may recognize was not you know, actually fulfilled. Like as we think about John's experience uh, you know, in the lily white suburbs, right, as a student, uh, he, I assume you were not only not being treated as a social equal, you were probably not being treated as an, an epistemic equal despite the A's that you brought home. Right. right? So I know, Seagal, that you're not you know, claiming that there was some grand past that you know, if only we could get back to it. But still, I hear your, what you are calling for, Seagal, is, as something actually much more normal than the transformational and emergency calls of the other two. I'm curious, can you reflect on that? Right. Well, so I appreciate the question. And actually, I was hearing echoes of this when I was listening to uh, my new colleagues here uh -huh. on the panel. <laughs> and I would say that probably this is a result of my effort to identify core democratic principles that we can try to articulate and sustain in a time in which both society and the planet are shifting, right? So what I'm trying to do is figure out a way to anchor our response to 
a social, political, and other uh, states of emergency, which is how I see them as well, right? How to address them in a way that doesn't let them string us away, mm -hmm. right? That doesn't let us, that doesn't lead us to um, follow along with the sense of emergency and lose some of the framing principles that I value and that I think we should value and we should frame our um, response with. I'll, I'll, I'll say just one more thing. The, so you were saying, uh, you know, a um, broken planet, you know, a broken democracy cannot heal a broken planet, right? And my worry is that the substitute for the broken democracy will be not democracy at all, yeah. right? And some people might even um, encourage us to think about stronger measures, you know, in response to either climate or other types of emergency. And I know that's not what right. you were advocating, <laughs> obviously, obviously, yeah. but, um, but this is the concern that I come from, mm. right? And so what might sound uh, conservative um, to you, and it rings in my ears too, so I'm not surprised by the depiction, but the, the conservative or maybe traditional um, perspective that I'm trying to articulate is one that espouses core democratic principles and adapts them to um, respond to uh, these kinds of pressures that we are facing. Rather than let you actually stop there, can you give us a concrete example of what you're talking about? Because I, I appreciate the sort of the, the abstract ideas, but I think it would help us if you can give us a specific example. Right, so you know, uh, the, the topic that I most worry about uh, and that you know that I care most about in the last few years is the issue of free expression, and I think, uh, democratically speaking, this is a core. You know, it's in the First Amendment. It, it's one of five, but it's still a really important one. <laughs> um, uh, the free expression is a core democratic principle, but it needs to be rearticulated um, in a way that responds to our current needs. For example, I think uh, the way in which we operationalize and enact free expression in a polarized context in which uh, there are both governmental efforts to suppress it. Uh, the most recent bill in Florida is an effort to create a government um, entity or unit which would uh, vet all events at public universities. I mean, uh, you know, when I was chairing the Committee on Open Expression at Penn, some people asked me to be in this job, you know, for our campus, like, oh, but can you look over and see that these are not hateful speakers or these are not whatever inappropriate speakers? And I said, no way, like, do you need, like, if you give me the power to decide who comes and who goes as a, you know, outside speaker, in a few years, I'm gonna get tired, let me tell you, which I did. So then somebody else sits in my seat and what do they decide? Do you like that too? Right? right? I mean, even if you like me, which obviously is not universal, but <laughs> even if you like you know, my decisions, what will you do with the next person, right? Don't give this power to anyone on a campus. Now you're gonna have it in the governor's mm -hmm. office? Mm -hmm. I mean, I, so, so the way in which we frame our engagement, our efforts, our um, training of the foot soldiers and the leaders, the way in which we teach them to um, uh, protect and uphold principles of open expression has to be responsive 
to these challenges. It has to be responsive to the increased visibility of diversity on some of our college campuses uh, and K-12 schools. It has to be responsive to changes in the way in which we define ourselves and think about our relationship. But it still has to be anchored in this vision that in order for us to operate as equal democratic citizens, we ought to be able to express our ideas and to listen to each other. Great, I, I have a question, a follow-up question for Nima based on what you said, but before I ask that, my guess is that Nima and John, you have thoughts in your head based on what Seagal said, mm -hmm. so I wanted to give you the opportunity to add on if you want to. Well, I, um, I, I respect what you're saying and I do see the dangers. There's no question about that. But in my view, this situation is such an emergency that we, that time is of the essence. Um, I, there's a sense in which the book banning, the torpedoing of DEI, mm -hmm. Um, all the things that are going on. And let me just say for our non-US uh, listeners, DEI stands for diversity, equity, and inclusion. Hmm. Right. Go ahead. And, and the bleaching of curricula uh, and the targeting of professors who uh, are not in lockstep with that mentality. All of that is in a sense um, trying to go back to what Bill Gates complained about. They're trying to preserve that blindness, yeah. right? They're trying to preserve it. They're trying to say, yeah. hey, that's where. And so I, the, the way in which I dealt with climate change is there are two kinds of climate change. Mm -hmm. One is in the physical environment. And I've seen, you've seen the New York Times every two, three weeks, you see these headlines about birds dying and, and all kinds of changes going on. And then the other climate change is the climate change that has been consistent, it's social climate change, mm -hmm. with my definition of progress for most of my life. In my definition of progress for most of my life, things have been moving slowly, grudgingly, but generally in the right direction with stops and starts. We're dealing with people now who are trying to reverse the wrong climate change. They're trying to reverse the social climate change and not look at all at the physical climate change. This is completely wrongheaded, utterly wrongheaded. Even if it's a debate on campuses about which direction progress is, to say you should not read Toni Morrison, to say you should not read Alice Walker, to say curating mindsets so that they do not they, we are not aware of the history of this country, the full history, only certain parts of it. We need to romanticize it because we don't want our young folks growing up being endangered, thinking they have to. Our, so, white, our white young folks. Right? Our white young folks. Right. <laughs> All right. So let me, I, right, I mean, so I can. Yeah, 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 yeah. Let me, <laughs> let me hand it over to Nima. Well, I guess I would just also say, and also like those folks are products of our schools. Like, they also came through our education system, right? And somehow, coming out of the same set of experiences, ended up in a really different place in terms of their understanding of what the issues are and what the needs are. I feel like I don't know how to, um, I, I guess I don't think things are as that far apart from each other, right? I think part of what you're talking about, Sigal, is that in the context of such polarization, like if we can't get people to see each other's humanity, and like be in dialogue with one another, there is no transformation. Right. Maybe some people are gonna to try to transform over here, but there's gonna be a whole other set of people whom like that leaves out. So right. you, can't, you can't transform collectively without some way in which people are able to see each other again. I think the challenge for me in my span of time as a teacher, which really stands the like it's 2003 is when I became a teacher. So it really was like no child left behind. And then like my whole teaching experience was like, oh, this is what teaching is. Um, and just watching everything get eroded, right? In that time period, the opportunities for young people to be face to face with one another and engage in that kind of work has just completely gone away. If you walk into a lot of classrooms right now, what young people are doing is sitting in front of a Chromebook, right? 
clicking away at a scripted curriculum, right? And so that, like, it's almost like we do have to transform to get back, or I don't know if back is the right word, but to get to a place where people can be in that conversation with each other does require transformation in our schools right now. Mm -hmm. Because what is being pushed as the model for making up for learning loss or for any number of other excuses for giving a bunch of people money to <laughs> sell products to our schools is, um, is that we, you know, like we have to have these models of education that don't really allow young people to grapple with, with questions, to grapple with the issues that are so important that we don't have answers to. I mean, that's the reality is most of these things, we don't have solutions or answers. Grappling would be what we would do, but we don't grapple anymore in school. Um, so I'm curious about this actually. I mean, this is kind of a, um, maybe a different reading of the facts. Uh, like Massachusetts now requires middle schoolers and high schoolers to have the opportunity to do civic action projects, yeah. right? That's state law, state interference in the curriculum, right? And um, uh, California now mandates ethnic, ethnic studies, studies. Yep. Uh, as a graduation requirement, right, in all public schools. Mm -hmm. Florida has actually um, been quite active in terms of promoting civic education and democracy education for many years. Illinois has pushed this, right? That There are a number of states in which we actually see a real push. So I'm curious about your claim that there's no space for this anymore. And in fact, you are now the Boston Public Schools you know, like, yeah, Studies. I am. Coach, right? So I would say, I think that yes, all those things are true on the surface. And then when you look a little bit deeper, if you look at the litany of standards in the middle school civics frameworks from the state of Massachusetts, they're ridiculous. If a teacher tries to teach all those frameworks, they will never do a civic action project because you have to spend three weeks talking about the difference between a state and a commonwealth, right? <laughs> like th there is. But do just, teachers ever actually teach the mandated curriculum? I mean, I think that when there's a uh, MCAS coming, which there isn't yet, there's right? been a threat of one been. every year for the last, right? And they don't tell you in September that it's not happening. And I should clarify, the MCAS is the standardized, the state standardized test here in Massachusetts. Uh, for which there it was there used to be one for history and social studies, and it was ended in 2002 or 2004, and has never come back since. Although there's been a promise slash threat every year, in part to keep history and social studies teachers on their toes. That's right. So they don't tell you in September that they're not giving the test. They tell you in June. Never mind, we're not giving the test. Mm -hmm. And so you spend the whole year talking about the difference between a state and a commonwealth. Right, I mean, I think similarly, if you look at the contention that happened in California around ethnic studies, there were very different beliefs about what ethnic studies should be. Is ethnic studies just a class where like one term is about black studies and one term is about Asian American studies and one term is about Latinx studies? Or is ethnic studies actually a critique of systems of power and really trying to understand the ways in which power operates in our country and how people and movements resist oppressive systems? In that disagreement, Oftentimes, the version of ethnic studies that is winning is the dry, fact-based, sort of like litany of facts version, right? Similar to what I think is true with the civics curriculum. I didn't want to teach civics anymore when I saw the civic standards that came out because my civics class was about race and power and mass incarceration and having young people engage with the biggest issues that in they encounter in their lives, and there was no space for that. So. I think that on the surface, few things are being named as a value, but then when you actually look at like what is then being asked of educators and young people, it actually makes it harder for them to engage deeply with the most meaningful parts of those disciplines. So that actually then brings us to the question that I wanted to ask you, and I'm going to phrase it in a way that may be particular to you, but then again, I'm going to invite the two of you, Seagal and John, to uh, chime in, um, which is that in your opening remarks, Nima, you said, you know, the work of protecting democracy is being left to educators and students, and that you want uh, district leaders, presumably state leaders, you know, state secretaries of education, et cetera, to, artic to say, no, 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 we are here to, to stand up for democracy, to stand up for truth. This is what we, you know, are standing for, not leaving you and your students to do all of the work. And yet, what you are describing, I'm curious, a lot of the work that you, I think, have been proudest of has been in these interstitial spaces, yeah. right? And what you're describing, actually, is that when Massachusetts finally says all eighth graders are going to actually take civics 
in action, right? Like, it, like it, um, you're like, whoa, no, count me out, right? So I'm curious, how do you think about the relationship between, right? And so Seagal similarly was saying, no, don't make me your philosopher queen about what kinds oh. of, uh, <laughs> oh, no, sorry, sorry. <laughs> maybe philosopher princess simply about like what talks I'm going to, you know, approve on the Penn campus. Uh, and yeah, yeah, talk to me about I think that it's actually the real issue is punitive accountability. If what the state said was like, we really believe that all young people should take civics, right? We want every young person to engage with this content. We're going to put out a set of recommended materials. We're going to give you resources that support the teaching of those materials. But you as an educator make choices in your classroom relative to what makes sense for your young people, right? Respond to their needs. Listen to what they're saying. If they say well, they want to go this direction, we trust you to go that direction. Like, if it wasn't a gotcha, where then it was like, oh, but you didn't get to the state versus commonwealth, and then the questions on the test are literally multiple choice. What's the difference between a state and a commonwealth? And then you got it wrong, and then. I don't know. Right, I don't. <laughs> Having I'm, been a civics teacher in Massachusetts, <laughs> I really, actually am not sure. Why does it matter? <laughs> I don't know why it matters, right? Um, I mean, maybe it does. I don't know. But, <laughs> but I think it is the glitch is the accountability piece, which is, to, and not like you can't have holistic accountability, but it's this punitive accountability where then like, oh, you can't graduate. Oh, your school is declared underperforming and then you're under like all of this pressure and teachers are being told they're going to lose their jobs and no one functions well with an ax over their head, neither children nor adults. It's the ax that's the problem, okay. right? There's a way to do it without the ax. But can I suggest that the other glitch, too, is just that we are refusing to see the democratic power of the different topics and issues and opportunities that people discuss in school beyond the civics class. Because mm -hmm. I agree, you know, I used to be a civic teacher a long time ago and in a land far, far away. But um, <laughs> That is itself but, struggling with democracy at the moment. Right. Mm -hmm. But people are on the streets. Mm -hmm. Right, mm -hmm. and I'm not going to. You should probably name the country. Israel, so right? So I'm I'm not going to, uh, you know, uh, idealize. But 20% of the population has been on the streets for 17 weeks now. Yeah, that's right. So, you know, and that really includes young people. And so again, we have a lot of problems, but this currently is not one of them. So, so what I want to suggest is that one of the things that I think needs to be named as well is the democratic power and centrality of education in itself mm -hmm. and the different subjects. I mean, the science classroom is a place of contestation when you do it right. Yeah. And you can teach science. Of course, I'm thinking about my daughter who is here in the audience and is a science student. Um, she, you know, you can teach science in the way that she's being taught by other people in the room, uh, thinking about, um, you know, uh, for example, the intersection of race and science and how science was misused and abused for promoting um, racist ideologies and how scientists can engage in a civic democratic exchange of ideas that would allow them to move forward hopefully in the right direction, as, as you indicated, right? So, um, so I think, um, you know, if you want to count, you know, if you want like, like qualitative, you know, quantitative proofs, um, you know, you can say, okay, people who are more highly educated are more civically engaged. Of course, the causality here is more complicated. But I don't think it needs to only depend on the civics classroom. Right. Right. We need to support schools. We need to support teachers as professionals. Whether or not there is a test in their area of teaching. And uh, if we do that, then we have a population that can uh, uh, recognize when it's being misled and can go out on the streets or into the lab or into the classroom and engage and try to change that. Uh, in, in Texas now, you're not allowed to do action civics anymore, right? Mm -hmm. In Texas, school children are not allowed to write their member of Congress. 
Well, so it cannot be a part of your uh, 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 civics yeah. curriculum to write a letter to your representative, <laughs> right? You know, so you may only know the difference between the one <laughs> thing and the other thing that you said. Uh, so, you know, I think uh, the effort to focus on facts uh, drives us away from the effort to sustain democracy, which is what education needs to be about. Let me, let me try a different uh, frame. I, I, I hear this, kind of, I know it's, I know it's Im important, um, and I, I, I share it. I share those concerns. I'm preparing future, aspiring college presidents, and you gotta get into the trenches. But I spend a lot of time working my way from the trenches to, to the balcony. Right? And I think that's where this, this really plays out. Skill set is good. It's essential in education. You got to ensure that people are employable. Right? Um, but mindset is becoming more and more important as it becomes more and more ignored. And so with that, I want to, and we're all talking fundamentally about mindset. Mm -hmm. All right, we have to push that. I, uh, the kind of mindset I'm talking about is captured best by um, W.B. Du Bois, who at age, I think it was almost 70, um, he looked back and he said, I've made a mistake. Uh, he said, I've been working all my life um, presuming that where things are going is positive but I didn't pay enough attention to what I should have paid attention to. He said, it's as if moving on a train, express train. I've been spending all this time concerned about the quality of my seat, which seat and in which car, and I did not concern myself with the destination of the train. I think we will become better educators if we equip our students with a destination mindset, all right? And this, this is the difference between Bill Gates coming out here and the guys coming out of Morehouse. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a destination mindset that we had. We had to be concerned about where this thing is going. And that to me is the best framework for thinking about the connection between education and democracy. Because if we don't if we don't give people the capacity to think with a telescope, if it's only with a microscope, mm -hmm. uh, we're in deep trouble. Yeah. That's like a don't look up mentality. So you got on climate change, physical climate change, don't look up, and you got on social climate change, Florida as the example, don't look it up. Yeah. <laughs> well, they don't want you to know a whole lot they don't want you to look at, right? Yeah. And those two things are going on, and I think the capacity we need to inject at all levels, every level we deal with, is with that destination, that telescope, right. that balcony view. So how do public colleges and public college and university presidents establish and teach this destination mindset in a way that is still um, cognizant of and open to political diversity. Uh, you, know. you mean in red states or blue states? Mm. Mm -hmm. well, so. I, I mean, I, I actually think this matters in, in both places, in part because it's false. It, blue states have a lot of Republicans in them, and red states have a lot of Democrats in yeah, them, right? Um, and so, and public universities, and private universities, but you know, public universities should be serving well, all, all, you know. All, no, so all. I meant that rhetorically. I know, no, but, but, me. but, I, but, I, but I mean it, you know, in fact. No, no, no <laughs> yes. okay, that, that's right. Um, so I just joined uh, PEN America as a uh, former college president. A list of them are, <laughs> are coming together now to begin the pushback. Nobody's pushing back much against what's going on in in Florida, and, the, and you saw, you all saw the Chronicle last week about the silence of the Florida uh, president. My guess is that everybody hasn't, so say a little bit okay, more about so it. Okay, so leave uh, a person here at Harvard, um, 
I thought it was the Ed School. Maybe I had that wrong. Maybe he was visiting it somewhere. But he wrote about the oh, shame. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I know who. The It'll shameful silence come. of the of the state college presidents in Florida. How they are saying nothing as this governor systematically changes the quality of life on campus. Literally having no clue and having a considerable agenda in education. I, I'm. Brian uh, McAllister, is that who it is? I believe, I, I believe so, but you can, you can Google it, the <laughs> silence of the Florida College Presidents. I, uh, that's very different from what's going on here in Massachusetts. It, it, most of us would find it inconceivable. Not to say that it's difficulty free here uh, or debate free, but the climate is changing radically in some of these states. Texas, oh, North Carolina, these presidents are afraid. And one of the best lines in that article was the job of a president is not to keep the job of a president because they're shutting up out of fear that they will be, they will be fired. Mm -hmm. They will be fired. That's where we are right now. And that has a whole lot of, that trunk has a whole lot of branches um, in terms of where, where the trouble is. So I, I do make a distinction. Uh, it's becoming more and more the case that the kind of president you can be depends on what kind of governor you have. The kind of president he or she lets you be. Yeah. And why aren't there alarms going off behind that? I, I'm concerned about the silence of Harvard. <laughs> yeah. I'll stop there. <laughs> no, actually, no, keep going for a minute. I, I just but, think. I mean, I, it, let's say, so President Bacco is leaving office uh, June 30th. Uh, President Claudine Gay is going to be taking it on July 1st. Uh, what would you like to hear from President Bacco before he steps down? Or well, from I, President I meant, Gay as she yeah. steps up? And, and I didn't, I'm not talking about Larry Bacco. I've, I've known Larry Bacco for 30 Five years. We worked together at MIT, and that's one of the reasons why I, I came here on the Drew. One of the things that I one of the things that I do in the books is I talk about how the presidency is in trouble. Um, that is to say, we have contractors now, and what we need are architects. And let me just say this: I was a an overseer when Drew Faust was president. And I want to say Drew Faust was the first president of Harvard who was an architect. She stepped out of the box and she took on the finals clubs, final clubs, right? And with her ear, and I was a student, we were banging on Derek Bach's door and Neil Rubenstein's door, saying, listen to us, the quality of life here on campus is choking us. We can't get a voice, right? Um, she listened to those people. Pat Graham listened to us too. Mm -hmm. She listened to those people and decided that she would start an inclusion and belonging. She set up a task force. And now there's an office there that has a redefined approach to this whole DEI uh, thing. And it's, it's very different. I could talk about that at length. I won't. We don't have time. But the bottom line is that re-architecture mindset is what we need more. Uh, that's chapter nine, by the way. <laughs> I'm sorry, right. but that's what Great. we need. Great, Nima, Contracts. you look like you wanna get in, and, as, and before you start talking, I'm going to invite those who would like to ask a question to start making their way to the microphones. Um, so you can get up and go, and don't worry about standing up while Nima, you're talking. Go for so, it, Nima. I'm not a higher ed person, but I'm from West Virginia. And you might know that in the last, well, you might probably don't know, because if you're not from West Virginia, you probably don't pay attention to West Virginia politics. But <laughs> the last legislative session was horrible in many ways, but one of which was that the governor um, really pushed in campus carry law through. Um, and the presidents of both of the public colleges in, in West Virginia, Marshall University and West Virginia University, the presidents of both universities came out hard against it. Students came out hard against it. The, tons of testimony, all of those things. It didn't matter the governor and the legislature still passed it because they don't actually care. What can, can you explain what a campus carry law is? It allows for people to carry weapons openly on college campuses. Um, and so it didn't matter. I mean, they weren't silent in any way, shape, or form, and it, it still didn't matter, right? And I guess I think, similar to what you were saying about this, the, the um, wrongheadedness of the red-blue situation, which 
it is not real, right? It's a construction because the most radically blue people I know live in Eastern Kentucky, right? Um, <laughs> for real. Mm -hmm. They put anyone here to shame in terms of <laughs> actually living their politics. I'm not just talking about them. Um, I actually think that I wonder about the question of solidarity, right? Which is to say, what is a space in which, because private universities have more flexibility and more freedom, what are the things that they can extend to public colleges and universities who often are serving a very different population yeah. with a very different set of needs, right? That many billion dollar endowment, like I'm, I'm still thinking about that number, mm -hmm. right? And I'm thinking about like, what is the function of that? If we have places where students do not want people to have guns on their college campuses, but like do not have the ability to prevent that from happening. And so what is the space for solidarity among higher education institutions? I think it goes to K-12 too. I think there's a real conversation we need to think about between public and private K-12 schools mm. and what solidarity looks like there. But I think part of what we have to do is kind of break and down some of those silos and say like even if it's not happening here to us like it is happening to all of us it's a collective crisis and so maybe there's a way in which the freedoms that exist in certain spaces can be used as leverage to extend freedom to people in other spaces thanks Nina. Mm. great um, let me add, I'm going to invite you to come up to the microphone please say your name and you know like who you are very briefly, and then ask a question and, and make it clear if it's to all of them or one of them. Go ahead. Good evening. Um, I'm from Boston College. I'm a doctoral student in curriculum and instruction. And I, my question is, you know, if we rise a little bit above the education system and we look at the larger political system, both at the national and maybe even the global level. And we just examine the two parts of your triangle, just truth and democracy. So in the case of truth, for instance, you have um, here in the US, you know, journalists are being punished and persecuted for telling the truth. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, when it comes to democracy, you have basically a two-party system that's governed by corporate interests and the interests of the military industrial complex. Given these realities, you know, is education even powerful enough to secure democracy um, for this country, but in general? So my question is for everyone. Thank Great, you. thank you. And can you tell us your name? My name is Ksenia, and I'm a graduate student from Boston College. Great, thanks Ksenia. I'll, I'll start. I, I, think, um, I think that answer is yes, and the answer has been provided, uh, as I said, by the HBCU tradition. Um, that is to say, um, by the way the campus was set up, the educational experience, they incubated a number of people who would prioritize leaving the campus, graduating, and doing something about the condition of democracy. And all of a sudden, by the 60s and 70s, you have all this new legislation, Civil Rights Bill, Higher Ed Act. There's a whole lot of things that, that were obviously an outflow from all of the activity um, going on. It can make a difference. The, the problem is most of American higher education hasn't given a sufficient damn about the quality of democracy. It hasn't even, it doesn't even broach, broach that question. And so you have more people coming out of our colleges um, trying to join the aristocracy rather than enhance mm -hmm. the democracy. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's, and that's the Bill Gates kind of, he, was, he wasn't concerned about those conditions. He just wanted to be um, wealthy. Can you give us one or two brief, mm -hmm. but concrete examples, the same way I pushed Seagull earlier. How exactly, like what do HBCUs do to build character and to give its graduates this destination mindset to su support democracy? 
Okay, so here I will step back. I say in the beginning of the book that I, you know, I don't, I, I'm going to use the handle black colleges, but mm -hmm. it's not all black colleges. Mm -hmm. It hasn't been okay. all the black colleges all the time. And okay. some that had this deeply and obviously uh, have lost some of it. Okay. Because they've, so that's number right. one. Number two, what, what they've done is, uh, and then I'll give a shout out to, to uh, Jarvis um, Gibbons. Gibbons. Mm -hmm. um, uh, what they've done is they, there has been the curriculum, but then there has been what I'll call, what has been called the hidden curriculum. That hidden curriculum was very necessary to HBCUs because it was dangerous to teach what ended up more and more, by the time I get to Morehouse, it was very explicit. You have an obligation <laughs> to, you cannot just go out and get a job and go live comfortably somewhere. You have an obligation. You stand on shoulders here. I mean, I was in, I, in my class, I had Martin Luther King III as Spike Lee. He came out of Morehouse intending, he did a black oriented film while he was at Morehouse. Jay Johnson uh, was at Morehouse. There are all these people who had a sense of mission, and I knew I wanted to come back and preside at Morehouse. Mm -hmm. So there is, there is this, this um, insistence that you have to be relevant. You, you cannot, you cannot go and be on the margins of this thing living comfortably. It's more in the hidden curriculum, the informal. It happens at Morehouse. We had chapel twice a week. Those chapel speakers from Julian Bond to Andrew Young, they were the top civil rights leaders mm -hmm. of the time, social activists, and that's all we got. Mm -hmm. And whether you are a chemist, a doctor, mathematician, no matter your field, you can't just do that. You have to do this other. So it was a different competency. Thanks, that's really helpful. I remember when I was living in Atlanta and um, uh, starting to try to learn about what HBCUs did for research for my book, No Citizen Left Behind, when I learned about the week, that the, like that first week that freshmen are on yeah, uh, Morehouse, Morehouse campus yeah. where they memorize the, the life, the biography of like Benjamin Mays and of King and they're expe they can be stopped by any upperclassmen and be expected to recite uh, facts about their lives, to talk about uh, their speeches and, and their leadership and uh, you know, walking around with candles, I think around the West End at some point, right? Like the, there are these really powerful rituals, rituals mm -hmm. um, that I think are part of, I mean, there are rituals of democracy too, right? Uh, and, and this is in a way I, I think of as a ritual of democracy through Morehouse. When, when Mays was there, he insisted that every student on this campus know the US Constitution inside out. Doesn't matter your major. And he hammered it. You need, because that document, in his view, was on our side, which means it's pro-American. The Constitution, I'm talking about. Thanks. <laughs> Hi, I'm Sadie. I'm a graduate student here in the Teacher Leadership Program, um, and I'm a K-12 educator. I'll actually be back in the classroom next week in high school history uh, and African American history. And I want to first start off in saying that there's a lot of hopelessness around these topics in a lot of places, and even though some of that may come from some of your thoughts tonight, <laughs> there, still, there still is a sense of hopefulness. And I, and I have Oops. spoken to other professors since I've been here at moments of saying, it just feels like whack-a-mole with all of these problems. And they were like, it's just not an option to give up hope. And I feel like we're still feeling some essence from all of you from that. So I want to thank you. My question goes a little bit into how we can bring in communities and intergenerational learning and families as part of this work. Because I think we've been speaking about teachers and legislators and a bunch of other things. But I think a part of the agency that we want to bring critical thinkers up in K-12 education includes their linguistic and cultural capital yeah. that comes from their communities. And how do you see that? that being a part of the invite to families to come to the table as opposed to a, a pushing out or a dichotomy against them. Thank you, Sadie. 
Nima, I know this is a question. It's your question, and I'm going to completely <laughs> Go like, for it. like say one sentence and, and <laughs> let you answer it because I really, you know, way better than me. I just want to note that the current efforts to bring parents into the conversation are oftentimes framed in a way that gives one parent too much power over all of the children in the group. And I liked the way that you. Uh, framed it in bringing your, um, the richness of your um, identities and experiences and abilities into the class rather than restricting what other people may learn. And we have to be careful in the way that we frame um, the opportunity for parents, which I very much value, right? but to frame it in a way that is enriching rather than reductive. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I really appreciate that question. And I want to be clear, like I am full of hope when I think about our young people. Yeah. It's the adults that make me want to tear my hair out <laughs> um, because the adults are making it harder, right? Like I think really if we were to give young people the floor and say, tell us what you need and want, and when we do that, they know what they need and want. It's just, are we, do we have the moral wherewithal to do it. So I, I, think, I think the hope is, is with them, but I also don't think it's fair for us to like just abscond it to them and be like, you figure it out. We're, we're gonna just keep pounding on normal over here, right? <laughs> um, and I think for me, like the answer to your question really is ethnic studies work um, and not ethnic studies just as like a discipline or a class, but really thinking about how the work of ethnic studies becomes the work of schools because so much of it is about making your, your story and your family's story and your community story text. Right? And really using those histories as the way that we understand one another and understand struggle and understand change is by bringing those stories to the center so that that is the thing that we value most. Right? It's, not the, it's not to say it's not important to learn about other people or other times or other places, but so often in school we only learn about everything else and we never learn about our stories. And so what would it look like if we started with our stories? And what would it look like if that was also involved, like bringing family in to share their stories, right? And being in that conversation with young people and really thinking about, well, let's talk about like your experiences in the city of Boston and like what are times when you feel like you've really struggled to belong here and like what have people done that's extended belonging to you or made it harder? And then how does that help us think about what systems or structures exist in our city that either support belonging or undermine it? Like there's a way in which we can get to structural questions through personal narrative. And I think that that is a space that we don't utilize enough. And it is a way in which I really think family and community have an important role to play in our schools. Great. Thank you, Yuma. Our next question asker. Hi, my name is Bob Atunde. Alfred, I'm a PhD student with Ksenia um, mm -hmm. at Boston College, despite all my <laughs> I'm in my second year and um, I'm thinking about all these ways in which we're discussing like, you know, you know, challenging some of these, uh, these modes of operation for how we think about education in the school. And I want to kind of piggyback off of uh, Ksenia's question a little bit because like these corporate interests and these militarized interests are, you know, deep seated in, in all of these institutions that we're involving ourselves, whether it be the state, whether it be Harvard, whether it be Boston College. And that prevent, that prevents a lot of folks from feeling like they have uh, sort of like the, the, the space to risk, to, to, to risk things in order to, to push forward social change. And I'm curious about what you all think about like sort of mass social movements needing to take place in order to really push some of these systems be, and, and the places that a, that a Harvard or Boston College can play in supporting a social movement of that kind. Uh, Nima, to, to your story a little bit, in leaving the school, I kind of feel like a there's a little bit of protest there. Like leaving is sort of like saying, like I can no longer operate in this in this space effectively anymore, and I want to get myself out. And that's making me think about something like teachers exiting on mass. And how do you support if teachers wanted to do that, something of that nature? How would you support teachers to do that? How would you support parents and students? Because you don't want to leave parents and students, no, you know, right. out in the cold. But like you know, but I'm, I'm just I'm trying to think like. If these systems are so entrenched and social movements throughout history have been the way to push things forward, 
how do we enable people to be able to do that comfortably so they're not having to risk much, sometimes risking it all in order to push things forward? Thanks, Robin. Yeah, I mean, I think that is the right question. I think um, I appreciate you seeing it as a form of protest. I wish I felt less guilty than I did to do. Um, but I think that the point, right, is that if, every, if all the teachers leave, the young people are still there, right? So ultimately, my question would be about the young people and the families, and what does it look like for young people and families to say no? Like, no to all of this. I and mean, because the reality of the situation is public education in this country has failed significant portions of our population for as long as it has been in existence. Mm -hmm. It's failed them through segregation. It's failed them through under-resourcing. It's failed them through the school-to-prison pipeline. It's failed them through, I mean, we can go. Yeah. And, and like, just millions and millions of young people and families have not experienced the promise of public education. They've experienced the pain of it. Mm -hmm. But so often that pain is individualized, right? There's no... There's no opportunity to like locate it in this bigger picture. And that really, um, and it, I'm not like making an argument for homeschooling right now. That's not, that feels like that's where this is going. It's not going there. <laughs> that's not what I'm trying to say. But I think that, um, I think there is a need for students and families to say not this. Like we don't want to do this anymore. This being nonsense standardized testing, this being, School days that start at 7, 10 in the morning and kids live an hour and a half from school and are getting up at 5 to get there. Like, there are so many ways in which we're enacting pain because of a profit motive, because we can't pay for more buses, so you have to leave at 5 because we're too cheap to pay for more buses, right? Um, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know what that looks like, but I think that my gut is that I think you're right, that it is the sort of collective refusal that is the only lever that we have for changing some of these things because... Certainly, like, plenty of people are critiquing these things, but the critique doesn't land because the critique doesn't impede someone from continuing to profit, right? It's when people say no with their bodies and their feet that things really maybe have the potential to change. And I'm going to channel this sl slightly differently and more pointedly to the two of you as people who have been at elite colleges um, that are perhaps even you know, more entrenched in this. But I do want to note that you know, part of what's, I think, behind your question that we tend to forget about, too, is actually that students have engaged themselves in school walkouts right, and in school strikes. Boston has been a, a site of this historically. Uh, Chicago had a major school mm -hmm. strike uh, by students. We obviously see the Friday um, uh, school strikes for climate, which is not exactly what they're called. Uh, I don't remember what Greta Thunberg's term is, but you know, basically the, the, the school walkouts that are happening around the world every Friday around climate linking, in essence, democracy and climate. Um, and uh, we, we've seen school walkouts through uh, March for Our Lives. And so I think part of what it's important to remember that we often forget about is that it's not only, say, educators and, and adult citizens who are engaged in very direct action around around schools, but also students. Mm -hmm. So now I want to take it and, and make it even more pointed. In places uh, with $53 billion endowments, uh, I don't know what Penn's endowment is. But, <laughs> well, yeah. But, so far. But, <laughs> but I assume you're still in the double digits of billions. Is that right for Penn? Yeah, yeah I'm trying to say, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Um, what does it mean to be an advocate for um, social transformation, for civic rejuvenation in an institution like this? I mean, I, I'll say briefly, you know, and a lot of this is coming from the students at Penn as well, although to some extent from, from others. Uh, I, you know... I have examples, but they all sound to me a little bit like excuses. Um, there is an effort, for example, Penn is um, supporting financially and otherwise uh, the public schools in our neighborhood. Mm -hmm. So those are not um, you know, campus lab schools or charter schools. They are neighborhood public schools that we are supporting through uh, per student top-offs or grants to the school through various involvements, you know, in supporting their teachers and principals, uh, providing tutors and various resources. So we do that with 
especially the K2, for various reasons, especially the, K, the, the K8 schools in our neighborhood. There is a student movement to try and um, uh, work against the gentrification of the neighborhood, which feels a little bit um, odd because uh, <laughs> most of the gentrification is for student housing. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. you know, um, so, so there are various efforts. There is obviously always more to do, payments in lieu of taxes, you know, so there are various ways in which universities can do more. Um, but I just don't want a, this fact and the fact of the corporate interest in these institutions to make us think in the way that uh, two of the questions were leading us, that democracy or education are ineffective and useless. If they are, I need to see what they are substituted with before I'm rejecting them, right? And I think right now, the only substitution I have is one of improving democracy through these right. uh, popular right. efforts mm -hmm. rather than um, uh, feeling hopelessness and yeah. giving up. Thank you. John? I'll say it very briefly. I think it's a great question. And, yeah. and I think that the, one of the kind of subtext of everything we're talking about is, is the fraying of America. And one of the consequences of that is making collective action less and less likely. There was a time earlier in my career when what's going on in Florida had a simple solve. All the Florida presidents have to do is stand up in unison and, and say no. The governor, this governor might, will not fire them all, right? And if he does, he's going to be in trouble. It's a simple solve, and it's, a, it's like a no-brainer, but the problem is collective, that word, and the values it implies. That's the problem. That's, where, that's what we're losing. That's what's eroding. Uh, the common values, a common sense of history, we've lost that. A common sense of destiny, we can't even go through a pandemic and, and not have a controversy over wearing a mask. I mean, this is basic stuff that we all know. I've had some sense of a growing confidence that we're going to see collective action uh, with respect to gun control. Hmm. I'm not so sure. <laughs> I'm not so sure because there's, I'm just not sure. So collective action is one of the consequences of a fraying democracy. And the solve for it is somehow collective action. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, it is past six o'clock. I apologize to those of you who are standing at the microphone, but I will remind you that thanks to our um, billions of dollars endowment, <laughs> we, uh, and the generosity of the um, Harvard Dean's office, uh, for which I am very grateful, we do have a reception across the street um, in the basement of the Gutman Conference Center, to which you you are all invited. I apologize for those of you online. You can raise a glass. Um, mm -hmm. uh, uh, and please, the three of you, get first dibs at cornering our speakers and talking to them. But in the meantime, will you please uh, join me in thanking? Thank you. Great. And then. Oops, I think I've been turned off, but I also want to remind you that, again, this is also the kickoff panel for the next two days of a conference uh, to launch the field of educational ethics. I hope that you found this conversation engaging and that you'll join us uh, online and or in person tomorrow and Saturday. Thank you. Thank you.